Professor Chung is going to share some of his work on developing methodologies for um, analyzing real-time data on uh, personal um, health care that he has developed with his team. And he's going to talk about a specific Bayesian monotone regression method called IPIPE. Yep. That's how you yep. pronounce it. And so I'll just um, give you the opportunity to hey, share great. your okay. Yeah, he's everything I'm doing. All right. Um, thank you, Ruth, for the uh, invitation and thanks for being here, both in person and online. And uh, as Ruth mentioned, I'm going to talk about a specific method today uh, called IPIPE, which is a Bayesian approach for monotone regression. And uh, um, but before I talk about that, let me see whether I can have full screen. Yeah. Like this is yes. There we go. Yeah. So and uh, so my my game plan today is I'm going to skip. Well, I, I probably can cannot skip all the technical details, but I try to keep the technical details to a minimum. Um, but if you're interested, uh, you can uh, find the all the full details in the articles here with the QR code. Um, I give you two seconds so that you can open your camera in case you're interested. But uh, uh, so my 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 plan is really to talk about. Okay. So, yes, and so my, I, I, my hope is that I can spend some time on um, uh, talking about the specific use case of these methods in, in a number of health settings and, and to fit in today's stream on real time um, health statistics. I'm going to uh, illustrate how uh, uh, this can be applied in those settings and what, what, why. This is important in that context. And um, with that, let's move. Go. So, uh, actually, uh, uh, monotone, monotone regression or isotonic regression, for those who are familiar with the literature, has a really broad application. So before I talk about the specific use cases, I'd like to um, give you some motivations in my collaboration that has really Put, be put together and to motivate this methodology. So I'm going to walk through a few examples. They're pretty generic, but they are actually something that I came across in the last few years. So the first type of examples is, is in creating clinical decision support. Again, there's, there's some real-time um, component in it. And so in this specific study, we have developed uh, a, in a Delphi study, actually, we, we with a panel of uh, neurologists and physical therapists uh, with identified factors that we'll use to determine whether a short patient will be sent home or be sent to a rehab after they've been discharged from the hospital. So this is uh, something that we published uh, a few years ago and uh, we've identified the, the number of factors. Uh, what we're doing now is to um, uh, continue with the panels, uh, try to uh, ask them to um, complete a few survey questions so that we can relate these factors to the recommendation where that patient should be sent home or sent to rehab. So, so the idea is that based, based on this ongoing survey, we want to train an algorithm so that uh, for clinics and for health settings that have no expertise like what we have in the panel, they can go to the algorithm and then based on the factors input, uh, we, we can make a recommendation on referral of the patient. So this is a very, uh, first motivation for, for this work, actually. And the second um, type of application that we're, we're uh, going to talk about in some detail in this talk is um, using um, bioassay for the, uh, cancer diagnosis. So biopsy is a gold standard of uh, cancer, right? So, and, uh, but it, it's, it is invasive and it is not feasible in a lot of settings, especially in those in low in middle income countries. So, so the idea is that in this study, we, are, uh, we have data on both the goal, the, 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 the goal standard, uh, the biopsy, which is why, and then we also have a bunch of um, um, blood assay uh, for it, specifically these are HPV uh, channels. So, and uh, so the idea is to use the HP, HPV channels to predict 
whether a, a patient will have a cervical cancer. So in this study, we have the, the label Y and then all the features are uh, in the form of HPV channels, per some patient covariate. So, so the idea again is to train an algorithm to see whether we can use a blood assay to, uh, to perform cancer screening. The third type of example um, is something that I've seen a lot in clinical trials that we want to use um, for multiple treatments to treat patients, and then we want to see how these treatments together uh, act on, uh, on the patient uh, in terms of the outcome. Um, and we've looked at risk predictions uh, using EHR data. We have, uh, well, have one project working on e-commerce where we want to use uh, uh, the, the user's history as well as the product features to predict whether a user would make a purchase decision. So, so this is really a list of questions. And, and in all these examples, as you can uh, imagine, it can be formulated as a multiple regression problem, right? So it is multiple regression covers a lot of ground, and it's so fundamental in statistics that this is something that we teach in year one of, uh, of statistics students. And so what we're trying to cover is very broad. But I'd like to uh, narrow the scope a little bit of these like, problems. Rather than multiple regression, these are actually what I argue, would argue is mountain regression in the sense that we will assume that uh, we know the direction of the effects, if there's an effect. Uh, as an example, you want to use H HPV uh, level to predict cervical cancer. A particular channel may or may not have an e effect on predict, uh, predicted value of cancer, but it, we can argue that an increase in the vi viral load will not decrease the chance of uh, like a cancer, right? So in this case, we know if there's an effect, the direction of positively associated. In e-commerce, for example, I can safely say that um, the purchase decision will be inversely proportional to price. So some people may be more robust against price, but in, mo in most cases, I believe that uh, when, when the price increases, uh, the likelihood of buy buying a product will decrease, right? So this is, again, the scenario where we can make an assumption about the direction of the effect. Risk prediction the same in using each each reach out. So so in a lot of the regression problem that we have seen in our applications, they are actually monotone regression settings. And now with this assumption, well, I want to see what we can do uh, to improve the quality of the analysis. Just to uh, set everyone one on the same page in terms of the mathematical notation. So a fair brief notations here. I'm going to use e sub k. Um, sorry, x sub k to denote the case condition right here. So a condition k uh, is defined by d different features or d different inputs. Uh, and each of these input x, x k, b, it's um, either a numerical or an ordinal variable. And, uh, and the theta is the surface response, which is a function of x k, right? And we're going to use theta k to denote theta, the value of theta under condition x k. And we're interested in estimating the response surface theta, or, or specifically each one of theta, one up to theta k with k, con k conditions. And uh, we're interested in, in the scenarios where k is large. So we want to estimate the response surface theta with as few assumptions as possible, uh, other than that uh, this, we want to assume the monotonicity, as I mentioned in the previous slide. And to be specific, we're going to um, assume that. So this is an assumption. We don't touch it during the analysis. We just assume it. And the assumption is that status is not decreasing in x uh, in terms of partial ordering, meaning that when the condition x is, xk is greater than and the condition xj, then theta k will be no smaller than theta j. So this is what we mean by partial ordering. And it's possible because uh, unless dimension is one, when capital D is one, uh, theta will have a partial or, uh, with a perfect ordering. So, but when uh, we have um, a dimension that's greater, q or greater, uh, some of the conditions x, k, and x, j are not necessarily ordered. And therefore, thetas are only, the theta k are only partially ordered. And again, the goal, the goal of this 
work is to see what, how we can analyze to estimate theta with as few assumptions as possible. Basically, we, the only assumption we like to make is monotonicity, no more, no less. So this is what we like to do. So in just few notation, capital D stand for the number of features in the regression and K is the total number of parameters we like to estimate. So these are sort of the two main numbers that you need to remember. Just to illustrate uh, using our uh, a very first example that is straightforward, very, very simple. So um, we have conducted studies were developed about 12 to 13 apps. So these apps are being applied. Uh, uh, actually, they, they were downloadable uh, but be, before they get commercialized. So they were downloadable in Google Play and App Store um, a few years ago. These are apps uh, for users with uh, depression and anxiety. So the goal is that uh, they can use the apps to, to help uh, managing the, the symptoms. And one of the things that we try to do is to um, collect um, data also from users and and we we'll, we'll send out uh, surveys to ask them to complete to know the status and um, but and we also want to be able to find ways to improve the engagement so that so that they can use the apps. So the theory is, is that if they don't use the app, they can benefit from it, right? So and the way that we're going to try to get them to use the apps is to send them push notifications. So in this example, there are four different types of notifications. So the dimension is four. So V is equal to four. So there are four different types of notifications. And then each of the notifications will be sent out on a different frequency from zero once a week and twice a week. So, so there we have four um, dimension and then and then each of the features has a use of an ordinal variable and this is a data set in about 5,000 users and uh, this is a subset where we have um, more complete data and uh, in, the, in the entire study and uh, in these 5,000 users um, we have different combinations of, of, of these conditions right so different x uh, k and then they are turned they, they, they from this in this data set we have about we have a total of 29 possible combination of push notifications frequencies. And, uh, and then for each condition, we collect the number of users receiving those configuration and then tracking the number of users who actually responded to the, to the push notification and uh, which result in high usage of the, um, of the apps. So in this example, we have four dimensions uh, and then we have a total of 29 conditions and the goal is to estimate theta what's the response rate of these participants under different condi conditions. And again, the assumption we make here is that the response rate is not decreasing in each of these F frequency. So now you may argue that, well, this is an assumption that may or may not be true, right? Because if you have ever used an app before, if you keep receiving push notification, increasing the frequency may actually reduce the likelihood of response, right? So, so what my point here is that let's just assume this is true in this case. I want to show you later in the slide under this assumption, um, the efficiency gain that we're going to have. And then, and then we can debate about whether this, this assumption is true. And in most scenarios, we probably want to bring in the domain expert to think about whether the assumption is proper. Uh, but we also want to show them what potential gain we're going to get with the assumption and um, we'll speak more about that later. But this is sort of an example just to illustrate the notation, um, which I'm, we're going to come back. This isotonic regression, monotone regression has a long history starting in 1955. Many of you haven't been born yet, I suppose. Oh, I, I, I wasn't born yet, so I think we included. And, uh, and it was a, a simple, uh, poor adjacent validated algorithms and um, um, and so it was a univariate problem just deal with one features one variables uh, but and then uh, recent years there's a steady growth in terms of dealing with isotonic regression dealing with multiple features multiple inputs um, but there's a large literature but uh, the, the the focus of literature has been placed on 
analyzing continuous features, continuous uh, independent variables with very few variables. And uh, uh, because of computational issues, um, we, we see a lot of works on that deal with isotonal regression in, let's say, from two to four dimensional space. I, I, I haven't seen much beyond that. And in order to help with the um, computation, um, much of the work involved additional assumptions, such as activity, meaning that the two, two features act in the, add, additively in the model, or maybe to use some splice, smooth it out uh, to, uh, to help with the computation. So these are sort of the, this, the, what, the, what the literature stands, which is good, except that uh, it doesn't quite fit what uh, are motivating examples. Number one, if you remember in the, uh, well, in the M health example, I just showed you two slides earlier. We're dealing with a very few discrete levels, three levels. Smoothing doesn't make sense. We cannot do smoothing, right? So, and, and, and then we also want to be able to handle problems with relatively large number of factors or number of input variables. So dimension is definitely much greater than four. And uh, being a statistician, I always like um, that we are able to make info estimation uh, to assess the variability. Much of the work in isotonic regression in the literature focus on point estimation, not, not too much about info estimation. And, uh, and uh, the third feature is nice to have is that we want to have a method that can be broadly applied to a wide range of problems in health settings. So as I show you in the very first slide, there are really different, a uh, wide variety of scenarios where we can use isotonic regressions. So become IPipe. So IPipe, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, is a Bayesian method. Uh, but I, what I want to highlight here is really, this is a pro projection-based Bayesian method. So if you can think about Bayesian method, it's in a way, it's an optimization problem, right? So you have either the posterior loss to minimize or posterior gain to maximize. So in some way, that serves as a good metric for distance. So and so and we could create some sort of projection, which is based on the posterior gain. So this is exactly what what I pipe you is fit a large basin model unconstrained, and then it's totally non-parametric, and then you make a projection onto the constraint space. So that's what I pipe does. That's the whole method, and I can stop here in terms of the methodology. But I'm going to break down the method in like different steps. First, again, fit the constraint model. Like for example, in the ML study, we're trying to like different um, combination of push notifications, right? So for each combination, we can simply fit the beta binomial model with a binomial situation. So so that's something that we could do. Everyone knows how to do it, and then. And then we do the projection. And then we go, we're going to break down the projection in two steps. And the idea is that instead of doing a projection on the theta space, we're going to do a projection on, on the gamma space, gamma being a um, indicator function of theta k greater than t for, for a given t. So uh, with this definition of gamma, we're going to do, uh, to do a projected estimation of, um, of gamma uh, and because this is a step function in terms of theta, so what we need to do is just inverse, uh, take, take the inverse of this function and then get estimated for theta. And that's where this, where the I comes from. And pi, I'd like to use it as a new, this work will be a, 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 a new meaning of work pi, a basic model meaning that do a, pro, a projection on gamma on, in a con, unconstrained basic model. Just so I, I'm going to go through very briefly, uh, like what, well, step one, I assume everyone knows how to do, or everyone who has taken Bayesian inference know how to do it. Inversion is easy, because once we know uh, what the gammas are, we can take the inversion. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how to do the piping. So, and it is basically, this is how we solve gamma, to estimate gamma with gamma hat. And, uh, and so capital gamma here is basically indicated the constraint parameter space and the pass ordering. So you, I'm going to skip the detail, but basically it is just a, a parameter space under, under which that gamma follow pass ordering. And this is the objective function that we want to maximize. And um, 
So maybe this is more illustrative. So this is an objective function um, that if you do some very, very basic uh, Bayesian operation, you can you can derive that this is actually the product, the product of a Poisson gain uh, of um, some classification type of gain function. So this is if without the constraint, this is simply a unconstrained Bayesian estimation problem with the classification type of gain function. And so the idea is that we maximize this, only consider this under gamma that follow this capital gamma, which is constrained space. And uh, um, so this is a Bayesian method approach. The question is how do you do optimization? So without the constraint, maximization is easy because of calculus, everything is, can be easily solved. But with the constraint, uh, the, the most intuitive approach is to do brute force. Uh, whenever we, want, when we see something odd max, we, what we can do is that we can enumerate all the possible gammas in the unconstrained space, and then evaluate, and then check whether that gamma is actually in the constrained space. And if this it is true, we evaluate the product and then save the result, and then we just pick the gamma that maximizes it. This is a brute force method to do it. And in, in the situation when the dimension is, is, is small, uh, we, it's not a problem. Uh, we've, um, uh, we've done it before and then it, uh, it also put it by different um, authors uh, in the literature. So for two dimensional, it's, it's easy. The problem is that when uh, the number of uh, dimension D is large or the number of condition K is large, then uh, the order of computation is to do to the power K. So it can go up very, very quickly. I'm going to show you the man too. So, so we, we have some competition issue. We, we, we're anticipating some competition issues when K is large, but let's put it aside. This is just a pipe. And then to do the inverse, uh, again, inverse, doing the inverse is easy. Uh, what is not trivial is that whether the inverse actually exists in all data set. And it, the proof is actually non-trivial. So it turns out that the inverse does exist. We prove that. And not only that, uh, it does give us very good um, interpretation by setting. Uh, so if you go to the objective function, uh, we have this decision parameter epsilon, which uh, determines sort of the, um, the false positive decision in, in, in a classification type uh, gain function. And it turns out that this epsilon also help us uh, with inference in the sense that if we set epsilon to uh, to be at 0.025 and 0.795, it actually would give us the 95% passive interval. So it give, nicely give us good uh, interval estimation based on IPI. So um, again, I'm going to skip the detail. Same issue with computation. Now in pi, when we do gamma, uh, the computation order is two to the power power k, k being the number of conditions. In the m health example, we have 29 conditions. That is about, oh, that's over 500 million iterations to use a brute force. It turns out to be okay, actually. I'm just marvel at like more than this computing power. It looks like a big number, we can actually do it. But that's only for one given t. To do it in the inverse, we need to do it for every single given t, right? So, and that's how we do IPI. And that's going to be a problem when we're dealing with much larger K. K equal 29 is actually a very small problem. Uh, but um, but um, so this is what I'm going to promise at the beginning that I'm going to skip all the technical details. So I can tell you that in the paper, we've developed two algorithms to deal with uh, computing iPipe. Just as it turns out, I, computing iPipe is easier than computing pipe. This is counterintuitive because well, when you do IPipe, you need to do IPipe every given t. But it turns out that we, we leverage some interesting theoretical results that is actually much easier to do IPipe. Even you, you just want to do pipe, you want to do IPipe because it's just much easier computationally. And I'm going to do one promise. I'm going to skip all the technical details, but I'll encourage you to read the paper. So the two algorithms that I've, we've developed in the paper is one is called sweep algorithm. The other is called RSM, sequential random subset maximizations. So these are the two algorithms that we use to compute IPI. And, and um, if you're interested in, in knowing the, the details of this methodology, 
I encourage you to read the paper and, and, and look at the algorithm. Now, going back to the example, uh, the first example in mHealth, uh, just to refresh your memory, four-dimensional problem, just 29 possible conditions, relatively small problem. Uh, and then in the, um, the it's a simple beta binomial model as a, uh, for a basic model. So um, so the the forest plot uh, on the, the golden forest plot is actually the, represent the, this uh, unconstrained beta bi binomial model. So we see that uh, for different conditions, each dot correspond to uh, a uh, the posterior median, and then the, the interval is the 95% posterior quadruple interval. So we sort of see a pattern that as the condition, is, as the frequency decreases, so this organized by the frequencies of the apps, uh, uh, push notification rather. And um, we sort of see some trend that as uh, the frequency decreases, um, the response rate decreases, right? So this is the unconscious model. We just let the data speak totally, no F no assumptions. Now, just with the assumption of monotonicity, we apply IPI. This is the confidence interval, or the positive interval that we get. Much cleaner pictures, right? So not only that, uh, the pattern is clearer, the interval with a much smaller. This is what we expect. But what, but what I didn't expect is the magnitude of reduction in the width of the, the positive interval, the, the gain efficiency is just tremendous. And, and in this particular example, it's kind of interesting just to look at this is um, that, uh, so these are a bunch of conditions that correspond to no response, almost no response rates, right? And these are actually the conditions where that we don't um, send out any notification on fourth type. But once we send a, a push in the degree, uh, no notification of the fourth type, it really doesn't matter uh, whether like it's being sent once a week, twice a week. But what's interesting is that once the fourth type is on, there seems to be a dose response between uh, on the first type. So once the fourth type of notification is being sent, we want to send more of a type of notification. And so this is, uh, an example where we actually can visualize the data and, and help us to, to, to get some practical recommendations in, in the health system. So we think about this, we're going to implement this in, in the apps to, uh, to, uh, to, um, to schedule push notification for each individual. And so the idea is that definitely the fourth type, but we also want to do the first type. And this is the type of interaction that we wouldn't see if we just fit the edit model, right? So, and so this is where we don't want to use additivity. And uh, so this is a very first problem that with the data and the, we could extend it to personalized um, situation so that everyone will have the, the different optimal uh, notification types. Um, but just to look at the computation aspects, in this case, if we use iPipe using brute force, remember there are like over 500 billion iterations in four seconds on my computer. So it's actually nothing. So in this example, we actually don't need any fancy algorithms. Uh, but if we just if we use the sweep algorithm that I did not talk about, but uh, it's, uh, it's almost a 24 reduction in computing time, less than uh, one fifth of a second. So in this example, we don't need to use any fancy algorithm, but it does give you a glimpse of the type of computation power you can save us. This is the first example. Uh, so again, the, the goal is to implement this in a, in, in a real-time setting, in a personalized setting, so that different individuals will have their own uh, push notification schedule. That's kind of interesting. Second example uh, is the cerebral cancer screening example I mentioned at the, uh, uh, in the earlier slide. Uh, so the idea is that in this study, we have each patient will come to one of the two clinics, we get a biopsy, so we, we, we know at the goal center whether they actually have cerebral cancer. And to be more specific, it's grade two or about neoplasia. And then we also have the blood assay, uh, and, and then this is the screenshot, what they'll get. So you, you see the the uh, the HPV, HPV values for each of the five channels. And then also we know the HIV status of these 
patients. So that, and then we also believe that um, and plus HIT positive will also increase the chance of having cancer in this particular population. So, so in, in, in this example, we have six, D equal to six, six dimensional problems, and we have about uh, 400, over 400 different possible configuration of the HPV channels. So you think about using computing IPI, the computation order is two to the power 400. No computer can do it. Brute force, I, I, I cannot use brute force to do it. So, but by using SWIP and, and SRSM, I can get it done in about 15 minutes. So it still, it still takes time. So I still need to like hit the, bu hit the button, go get a coffee, come back, wait a little bit, and, and then get the results. But it's much easier than doing it using um, human what I call it, human exploration. So this is an actual data set that has been published before by my colleague at Columbia, Ruiz School, who is a great epidemiologist. She's very good at like, so she just used logistic regression and then try different configurations. She try really hard and get uh, to use these five channels plus the HIV status. And this is what gets her. So uh, using her result, the red line is the AUC, the basic re reflected accuracy of the, the, uh, the, the model that she fits. Using IPI, this is a black line here. Very comparable. You say, well, computer and humans are sort of lost. Why, why do we care? Um, uh, so basically, I think she, she, she spent like three months of work with, like, with the help of a postdoc. For me, it's a 15 minutes. So this is number one. Number two, this is just a six dimensional problem. If you imagine that you were dealing with a, a problem with, with many more assays, I don't think human can possibly handle that. So this is where um, the, the iPad would be very useful as we increase dimension. And, and one of the criticism is that this is such a black box, right? So, and then we just I pipe and then one. I don't know what you do. This is what I'm showing. Actually, this is based on human exploration. So they, they do logistic regression. Everything seems to be very inter interpretable. At the end of the day, this is the algorithm that they get. So you need to follow flow chart to determine where the patient the essay that that patient will have cancer or not. It's not simple at all, even if it is human exploration. So, so I, I think that in, when in the context of real-time um, uh, cancer diagnostic, I don't think interpretability is an issue. Rather, it's really the computational uh, power that can improve the accuracy. That's important. And uh, so, and and in so the the real-time setting here is that. So this is again the screenshot that we are going to to get. Uh, and uh, in in the application and um, and so the idea what we're going to do is that this is from the screen. What we're going to do is that we're going to use the point of care surface, and that we're going to to use a camera taking the screen, read the data, input into your app, and then the app will calculate uh, a, a result based on the algorithm, and then make a diagnosis. So that's total automated. And the reason is that we don't even want people to enter these values, because entering values can be complicated. And then also, and then and also in case that we want to expand the number of channels, entering is going to be nightmare in real-time settings. So this is um, this is where like the automation is very important. The, but so it also gives us the the motivation motivation why iPad would be useful rather than like just using human exploration because interpretability in this case might be may not be as important. So, um, so this is a second example which is very very interesting. We're we're going to implement this in a real time setting. And how much time do you have? Do you have time for a third example? Okay, maybe I'll skip this one. If you would, we have time, we come back. But this is also very interesting. This is a setting where. This is in a trial setting that we want to look at the effect of sedentary breaks on health outcome. Oh, yeah, okay, good. And um, so we're going to look at the health effects of sedentary breaks. So, and so we know that prolonged sitting is not good in terms of your diabetic, uh, diabetic uh, uh, cardiometabolic param uh, parameters, such as like your blood glucose, your blood pressure. Sitting here is not for too long, it's not good. So the idea is that. Um, we want to introduce breaks to ask people to walk around. Um, and then a, a, a break feature is 
how often do you take a break and for how long is the break, right? So this is sort of the two dimension problem, two dimension problem and in each one is different. So this is an example in which we actually um, use IPipe in the context of a hierarchical model. Because uh, so each participant in this study will be bring back to the lab multiple times. And under each time, they will, they will have different conditions in terms of combination of break frequency, break duration. So, so the, the idea is that uh, um, how do we model um, those and to look at the effects of data. So, um, and this is actually one of the ongoing study where, um, so the two, the two previous examples are something that in the work in terms of making it real time. The, this example is uh, the one that we're currently doing as a real-time randomization problem. So what happened is that participants will be joining the study, and then we just randomize them multiple times uh, on different combination of um, uh, setting breaks over uh, each time. And, and then we divide the endpoint, the endpoint being um, uh, the glucose level, continuous glucose monitoring, using glucose monitoring. And, uh, and then we update the data, and then we use the IPipe algorithm to update the randomization prob probability. And, and then the, the criteria is to um, assign the next participants to combination that tends to work better. So that's where the real-time component comes in. And, uh, and not only that, it's real-time, it's actually, it has to be computed very quickly because um, the, the participant will arrive 8 a.m., Eight in the morning, and then they need to get the randomization right away because we don't want to randomize a participant too early, um, and then they don't show right. So and but so in order for us to implement this real time, we want an IPUB algorithm that is really really fast. We're talking about seconds of computation. So, uh, so this is actually a, this is supposed to be a a, a animation, but I, I just realized that. Um, I send you, I, I get, this is a PDF which does not have the animation, but what you, you will see on the PowerPoint is that uh, you see that uh, it's a similar, similar to trial how the, 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 I, uh, the adaptive eye pipe will randomly assign participants to different uh, break frequency and break duration. So we're exploring about 25 different possible combinations. But I'm going to skip that, but this is another application of pipe in, in a real time health setting. And some simulations, so I'm, I'm going to skip this one. And so this is, a, so in so far in all the examples I've illustrated, the dimension is right below. Mainly because I want to illustrate, so I, I don't want to, it's easier to illustrate, but the iPad can actually be implemented to a high dimensions, which is one of the motivations for, for my work. So in this simulation setting, I explore up to 12 dimensions. So we have 12 axes. And then why is an exponential outcome? You can envision this as like a um, survival outcome. Um, and so, so the idea, so this is sort of the data generation, data generation model. And in the simulation, I compared unconstrained methods. So for you, meaning that in each condition, uh, in the unconstrained method, I just fit um, using a, a stand, a, a conjugate prior on for, expo, for the exponential uh, distribution. And to estimate data, and I use iPad, of course. And uh, and when we look at compare the efficiency in terms of mean squared error, the efficiency gain is huge. In, st in standard statistical literature, if you have a new estimator, if the new estimator improve the existing estimator by twenty percent in terms of MSC, I think that's very very substantial. We're not improving 20% over 10 times. Um, in a high dimensional case with over 3,000 conditions, again, this is where brute force doesn't work. We have used SWIFT or SRSM to compute IPipe. In this case, uh, the unconstrained method, uh, mean square error is about two, meaning this is a unit, but we don't know what it is. Relatively speaking, you use IPipe. Mean square error is 0.17, 20% reduction, a 20 fold reduction, sorry, not 20%. So, so it goes back to the very beginning uh, when I talk about uh, when we use iPipe, we use an assumption. An assumption is wrong. When the assumption is wrong, 
that's not a good thing. But in light of the substantial gain in efficiency, this is some a proposition that we probably want to explore very, very hard with the investigators to make sure that if this is true, we definitely want to incorporate monotonicity in our estimation. And I published one method, and uh, there, there are other methods we can I, uh, to do uh, monotone regression, but I think IPAP is so far the method that can handle this kind of dimension of data uh, problem. It's, again, this is a 12 dimensional problem. So, um, a few talking points. Um, hopefully, uh, the previous simulation show you that uh, if monotonicity is a reasonable assumption, efficiency can be very, very substantial. Right. And, 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 um, and IPipe, it can be used with a broad range of models. Um, so in one example, I show you that it can be applied in Bayesian hierarchical model setting, but it can be applied to general SME model, Cox regression, and any type of models. And it can be, as long as we can use it to train the unconstrained Bayesian method, um, we can use with those IPipe with those models. And um, so it's really broad. And in most examples I've illustrated, we're interested in estimate and mean, right? So the, the response rate, uh, uh, the, the cancer rate, but you can actually be applied to model other parameters such as autocorrelation in the context of AR, uh, auto regressive model, because we know that uh, under the autocorrelation is that rho would decrease as two points are farther apart, right? So this is the monotone assumption we can make. So iPad can be used to estimate those problem parameters. Now, going back to the theme, so I type as learning how system. So I walk through three examples. Each one of the examples is I try to talk a little bit about the, the application in the real time health setting. And but what's important in that context is computation. I pipe can handle higher dimension than other methods so far, as far as I'm well aware of in terms of monotone regression. But if it takes five days to do a computation, it cannot be applied in the real time setting. So so the ongoing work is really to improve algorithms to speed up the computation. So in the um, in the simulations, um, so as I mentioned in the pseudo cancer examples with six dimensional problems, it takes about 15 minutes. In the simulation setting with 12 dimensions, it took about four hours for one simulation replicate. So it's actually non trivial computing time. So, but, so I would say that in order for it to be for prime time for real, time application, we need to speed up the algorithm. And uh, this is something that I'm actively working on. This is really one of the priorities of my work and, uh, and folks work with me together. And, uh, and the new guide algorithm will also allow us to work with a much larger number of inputs. And now currently, I'm working on one current examples with 27 dimensions and, uh, and one with 50. So, and so these, but the new algorithm tends, seems to be promising. And, and uh, so, so this is definitely one area of of work that uh, needs to be continued work on. So, this slide is for statistician compared to like uh, people who, are, uh, who do machine learning uh, as as brain computer scientists. So, if you believe that like all machine learning, most machine learning methods are just regression. So you can see the potential of using IPipe as a statistical learning or machine learning method, right? So, and this is really um, the uh, the motivation for why we need IPipe in addition to lasso, in addition to random forest and all these machine learning methods. And simply because of the fact that IPipe provides a, a transparent set of assumptions that we're making. And it is a minimum set of assumptions uh, that we um, we know where the efficiency came from. So I, I think that's really the motivation of using IPipe as opposed to other non-parametric machine learning methods like random forest, give you something, but we really don't know what it entails. And it's also advantageous compared to the more parametric approach like logistic regression, which can cause bias if the model is incorrect. And IPAP also has, has this uh, advantage of being able to pro provide inference, uh, provide uh, Bayesian posterior intervals, and, uh, and it is quite versatile in, in the sense that it can work, you can work with other machine learning methods. Um, so, um, Again, this is uh, ongoing work. And with that, I think that's my last slide. And thanks for your attention.
So this is when we ask people, do you have any questions? Do we have any questions online? Nathan? Um, uh, you know, the assumption of non ethnicity seems strong, right? And that's when there's sparse data and it benefits because we've made that strong right. assumption. But your example with the with the uh, the M health thing was when there was one of the combinations was uh, very confident and kind of to the left hand side. It just sucked everything else after that to right. the left hand side. So it seemed sensible to me to sort of weaken that. So you could kind of have a, in my mind, like a strong prior of monotonicity, but not like a hard, a hard assumption. So you say that I'm. 90% confident that it's uh, monotonicity. So it doesn't necessarily, that sort of behavior wouldn't necessarily occur. If the data was so um, uh, in contrast to yeah. your assumption, then the data would be able to influence the inference. You see what I mean? Yeah. At the moment you've got very hard assumption and you could soften that as a, as a distribution rather than as a you know, as an indicator function. Yeah, so thanks for the suggestion, Nathan. And, and I think that's a great idea. However, in this case, I would argue that first, I think monotonicity is not a strong assumption in general compared to, for example, logistical regression, uh, compared to additive regression, right? Because we, we don't have any kind of those other things. And, and in this particular case also, um, uh, yeah, you may be curious why I limit X to up to twice, um, uh, uh, up to twice, because actually we did some prior work in that we do other methods. We realized that if we send push notification more than twice a week, it actually tends to have a negative impact. So that's that's why in this particular illustration, we we do have believed that monotonicity is true. So so this is what I'm talking about. So we could definitely circumvent the the the. The, the, the strength of the assumption by using statistical modeling. But I think what is more, might be even more effective is really to communicate with the domain expert and to do some additional exploratory analysis and then to, to see whether monotonicity is actually uh, credible. Mm -hmm. In this case, we believe it's credible and therefore uh, we felt comfortable using it and then to lead to the substantial efficient gain. And so this is also my first approach to so far first like being very pragmatic about it but i think uh so it's so i feel comfortable about defending that but your point is well taken mm. so i mean i imagine there are situations when the only situation is it's it's monotonic i mean i can't think of any there's probably some problems where that's a real that, that assumption is the only possible situation right rather than something that you're kind of imposing Right. Um, I don't know. Like a correlation proof. If something has to, you know, two things have to increase at the same time. Right. Yeah. But, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Mona? Yeah. So, in, in the example, in the MHAS example, when you've ordered them, okay. So, monotonicity in terms of the axis, okay. Is there a specific, I'm just trying to understand if there's a specific rule whether X4 should, you know, has more influence in your ordering than X3 or what did you use in order to establish that monotonic order when you have X1 till X4? Mm -hmm. So if, for example, the switch between what you've considered Okay, on top, basically, okay, did you, cons you consider 22221 as superior to 21222? Two, 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 two? Right. Okay, so what determines this ordering? Is it just the frequencies there, or is there anything more theoretical to that, assuming that order? Right, so it's just the frequency there. So probably it's based on, I think these two will be the dominating factors. But it also, I think intuitive, what will happen is that um, 22221 appear to be better than 2122. It might be because that there's some conditions that is lower than 2221 that show to have a high response rate. So that's not the push it up the response rate, right? So And so that's where the monotonicity comes into to use uh, other condition that are partial order. 
to help uh, give you information on that particular condition. So, uh, so maybe let's see. For example, if we look at this condition of like 2211, 2211 is a condition that's lower than 2221, but that's not lower than 2122, right? So, but let's say that if this condition 2211 has a response rate, it's not doesn't appear to be high, but let's suppose that's the case. That may be the situation where that you will you will lend itself to uh to the estimation of two 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 one to uh, to sort of delimit the lower lower bound for two 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 one, and that's how the the um uh the the monotonicism comes in, and also um, mathematically it's based on the uh the posterior the objective function that we define, right? So. So would it matter if you switch around the variables, basically? What would happen? Oh, oh so, uh, we, we, but by switching, do you mean switching the data? Yeah, switching around the... That's a, yeah, I, I have not tried, so, but that's an interesting question. So one, yeah, so I have not... Yeah, I have to, yeah, I confess I have not thought about that, but I think that's... One one related thought I have on this is, um, it can we use I I because it's based in approach, right? So we could actually use some sort of at least some um, base factor or or um, BIC some sort of criteria to determine whether a given feature is useful. For example, in this data, it looks like that X two and X three are not useful, right? So. The question is, is there a way we can reduce the dimension of the problems by use comparing, say, iPipe with four features compared to Apple with three features and then compare the, the, the BIC? I mean, that sounds like an intuitive approach to go about this, but, it, uh, but, but it, your thought is interesting about promoting the data, and I have not thought about that, but interesting. <laughs> Like uh, trying to understand how, you know, when you did the surgical example and you said you take it photo so that we don't enter the data. A, isn't the data sitting somewhere? Why are we taking you know, a photo? Uh, so if, if you can. Oh, take your photo. Yeah. So this is like a practical. So the, 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 the clinical settings is important. So this is um, the studies are done in South Africa and, and, and in situations where we don't have the types of resources and ex expertise, to be honest, to, to, to reliably enter the data. So what the, the idea is that um, uh, we can provide a device to take a photo from the screen. So what you see, this will be on the screen, right? You take a photo, photo and then the photo, and then we can use some sort of rec uh, like pattern recognition to, to identify the numerical values of the input. And then based on that, we feed it to an app, and then the app will produce an output. You said, yeah. yeah, it's there. So if it's on a screen, so it's isn't it sitting on data somewhere yeah. that can be transferred to you without taking oh. the photo? I'm just sorry. I, I, oh I, yeah, the photo is just a pragmatic way to enter the data because we don't want to rely on people entering data manually. Fine. So, but you said it's on a screen. Oh um, yeah, but no, but they, oh, I see what I mean. It's a different system. So I mean, they use their own device to do the, the to do the essay. Uh, I think there might there may be some unless there there might be some property issue to write a PI to get numbers directly from the machine to my app. So I, I think that yeah, I, I I get a point. So yeah, yeah, this this is the the business behind the science. So and and we can directly write API. Okay, and then okay, following that, okay, assume we can't directly link it, okay, and we need to take a photo. Uh, to what extent is the photo quality? Oh. important and the angle that is where it is taken and what 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 are the implications what are the likely implications on your data basically and if you say taking you know photo shoots of it yeah. um, how do you ensure that they're taking the whole lot that needs to be transferred so what are you know these practical implications that influence definitely if they are not done in a proper order and yeah. specifications will influence what you get out basically of your right so um, so to what extent you know it is prone to such deviations from the ideal situation whatever that is that, that's a great question so that's why this this is sort of the bottleneck of the problem now, and but but uh, 
I would say that the technology is actually fabulous and uh, the the recognition is good, but we just it's about looking for the right vendor and yeah, but it's um uh and and it would definitely induce additional errors. And this is something that might be a a useful statistical problem to solve, right? Because you 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 add an additional level of uh, transition. So the the comparison would be, I think, a practical viewpoint is that whether that error would be more severe than human input error. So um, of course, the the ideal situation, as you said, is that if there's no bits, no bits involved, write an API to really fetch the app. That's perfect. I'm not going to give them that my my algorithm. They're not going to give me the software. So so we're not. We that has to be something in the middle, and and but so I so other than the ideal world, so either human input or imaging input, but that would be an interesting practical comparison, and of course it will also uh, be a collaboration with folks and in the uh, in the imaging technology world, and uh, I, but I think there are quite a few vendors out there. I'm not involved in that part. But uh, for, uh, in the business part, I guess that he's, he's talked to vendors a little bit. But that's a that's a great question. I I, I, I sort of assume that yeah, I would just, just take it as it is. But it, that can be ever. Thank you. Thanks. Let's just have a, a, a final question. Um, so this is more broad. It's, it, it's more about how this type of methodology, a more advanced methodology, is being currently used in the apps that we carry every day into our phones. Uh, by experience, I know that sometimes the, the statistical methodology supporting like the, the recommendations are not necessarily as advanced as what you presented. So from your point of view, I mean, uh, I, I'm, I think you do some um, work with external companies and other projects. So would you say in a few years or how, how many years, uh, how spread would, or how much confidence we would have on the apps and the recommendations we get from the apps mm -hmm. and the methods that are behind those recommendations? Yeah, so that's a very great question very, and very broad. Uh, it would depend on the context. So uh, if it were for, to be honest, in, in many of these problems, I really love the work of iPipe, but if we have really, really massive data, logistic regression, for example, would likely be sufficient in many applications so in terms of accuracy, right? So if we talk about predictive accuracy, the the idea is that um, one of the simulation the simulation comparisons when I compare the unconstrained estimation and I pipe during the 20 fold reduction in MSC. I think what I what specific application I remind is for in the context of either e-commerce or uh, hospital data. If you imagine that you are a local hospital, you have your own EHR, but you're not connected to a big large health system. Because I, I don't know how the, the health system in, in UK works, but in, in the US, if you're part of the health system, you have a lot of data, but if you're like your individual hospital, then you don't have as much, right? So, so the idea is that if a small hospital with your own data, uh, can you or can you train based on your own data with sufficient uh, accuracy? And and that's where iPipe would be very useful. And those are, I would say, um, that that will rely on the inputs, right? And uh, and but in terms of the technology is there. It's really um, if you work with EHR data before, you know that data cleaning is the main issue. It's not just the statistical issue. So, and that's the part that I think we're making progress. We're, we're not making substantial progress enough to have it happen tomorrow. But uh, so the idea is that uh, I, I do talk to a lot of different um, non-statistical like a uh, partner uh, but I, I think as far as this problem is concerned our community is doing a great job in terms of giving good algorithms for people oh well, thank you very much you. Ling, and uh, sharing a very very interesting presentation so should we just uh, have a thank you. okay so um Let's move on to our next.
presentation. See, this time I can get the slides. Okay, so our um, next speaker is going to move us from the perspective of looking more at an, an end of one level or personalized healthcare and take us, us to an end of all level and uh, population healthcare. Uh, and I am very happy to introduce uh, Dr. Angela Nufali. Uh, so, Dr. Angela Nofali is an associate professor at Warwick University. She's based at the Warwick Clinical Trials Unit, but she's not going to talk to us about clinical trials. Uh, so, she has been collaborating with the, and I need to read this, uh, Real-Time Syndromic Surveillance Team, which is part of Public Health England. So, this team has in place a surveillance system well, the government, which is uh, used to detect the emergence of illnesses in the population in England, uh, and then they might activate public health action. And this is uh, done in a, a real time or near near time uh, fashion. Uh, so today, uh, Dr. Nufali is going to talk to us about a specific method that is used by, by our um, by the Scottish government uh, and compared with different methods. And this is about regression-based statistical aberrations, detection algorithms, or case count outcomes. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Ruth, thank for you. inviting me. And uh, thank you for uh, coming to this talk. I have to apologize for the delay. I'm sorry I missed your talk. Uh, I have to, the joys of mama, I have to go to a &E this morning with my daughter. She wasn't breathing well, but since she's fine now. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you just click, yeah. So um, my talk today, like uh, Ruth just uh, said, that uh, it's on a regression-based algorithm for uh, aberration detection. Uh, it is what everyone um, calls it by the uh, Farrington algorithm. So it's called, uh, it's named after Professor Paddy Farrington, who, uh, uh, who started uh, that algorithm at uh, Public Health England. And um, and basically, I'm going to talk about the evolution of this algorithm from um, from when we have uh, when I started working on it in 2011. Um, basically, how we improved it, and uh, then how we uh, evaluated it in comparison to other algorithms that are used here in the UK and uh, in the US, and um, later on, how uh, recently we expanded it to include multi-site uh, detection and some further work uh, in the end. So um, I will start off uh, by uh, talking about, um, in general, epidemiological surveillance and aberration detection uh, algorithms, specifically uh, the Farrington uh, algorithm, and uh, how we evaluated it with the uh, RAMI algorithm, which is currently used also uh, in public health uh, England, currently the UK Health uh, Security Agency, uh, for syndromic surveillance. Um, and then the implications of these algorithms on public health, the extension to multi-site surveillance, and finally some further work. So um, epidemiological surveillance, like we all know, uh, it's been used nowadays more and uh, more uh, because of the increasing public health threat threats, uh, such as you know the most recent pandemics like the COVID-19, the H1N1, and the SARS, and so on. And also due to the quick spread of infections because of the world, you know, the world is becoming more and more populated and because of the increasing environmental risks. So
So there is a need for accurate and efficient uh, and quick enough algorithms to detect infections or uh, aberrations on time uh, in order to take controlled measures to protect public health. So like I said, uh, the main talk today uh, will be about the talk will be mainly about the Farrington algorithm. And I'll uh, set the scene now, tell you how it works uh, using an illustration on the Salmonella and Fentus, um data. So here we have uh, counts, weekly counts of Salmonella and Fentus, uh, I think from 1996 to uh, 2011. So this is the 14th week of 2011. And um, vertically, we have the weekly counts of Salmonella each week. Um, so uh, the Farrington uh, procedure, it fits a quasi passo model uh, to our uh, data. And then using that model uh, predicts uh, the expected count uh, currently. And it fits this quasi passo model to uh, comparable weeks in previous years. So this is week 14, it fits it to week 14 and the year before and before and before. It fits it to a window of weeks in every year, so seven weeks each year. Um, and then, using the uh, regression model, it predicts an expected outcome. This is the observed, and then uh, lower and upper uh, thresholds. And how does it decide if the current value, the observed value, is an outbreak or a not? using the following uh, scores for the exceeded score. So if the observed one is expected divided by the upper threshold one is expected is greater than one, then an alarm is triggered um, for a possibility of an outbreak. So we say there's an aberration, but it, that could be an outbreak. So we need to investigate it further. Now, um, since 2011 till now, we've worked with Fabi on improving the algorithm. And um, we have kept the quasi poisson model, but we have made uh, uh, we have modeled seasonality more accurately by using um, the whole lot of data. So rather than just using those uh, those comparable weeks in previous years, we have um, used a can level factor and we use those weeks as a reference weeks, the ones that are comparable in previous years. So we made use of the whole uh, baseline data set. We decided to fit a trend always. We computed uh, the dispersion from the full set of data now and um, computed thresholds for uh, basically decision making whether we have an aberration or not based on negative binomial contacts. So the upper and lower threshold on the confidence intervals of the expected value from negative binomial contact. And finally, uh, one nice thing about this algorithm is that it underweights uh, previous outbreaks so that it reduces their effect on current predictions. And the, it does that using unscombed residuals. So any high enough, uh, high enough count in the past would be underweighted so that it doesn't uh, mess the model. So this is the main, uh, uh, the main idea about this uh, method, how it works. And, um, and like I said, it's currently used at the UK Health Security Agency um, and it runs on a weekly basis, but it runs on um, laboratory confirmed uh, pathogens, so infectious disease pathogens. Um, so everything is uh, everything comes from the laboratories and these are confirmed. So let's say someone gets ill, like my daughter today, goes to the, you see, uh, the GP, they take a sample and um, they, uh, you know, then they say, okay, let's say this is salmonella, this is a uh, respiratory infection. And they send all those at the end of every week to uh, Public Health England in order to, um, and then Public Health England records all these things and accumulates uh, all this data on a weekly basis and runs this algorithm. So this happens uh, for infectious diseases, but it also happens at Public Health England for syndromic uh, accounts. So by syndromic counts, I mean uh, counts of symptoms. So, um, and these are, um, and these are 
non-confirmed, non-laboratory confirmed in, uh, symptoms. So you feel ill today, you call NHS 111, you say, I have a cough, I have temperature, I'm very tired. So that's a symptom. So um, epidemiological surveillance in the UK uh, happens at different levels, at the infectious disease confirmed level and at the syndromic level. And different algorithms are used for each of those in public health England. So the Farrington algorithm is used for infectious disease confirmed pathogens and another algorithm called the RAMI algorithm. It's used for syndromic surveillance. Um, so this is exactly what I've just uh, said, that infectious disease surveillance happens on a weekly basis, but syndromic surveillance on a, a daily basis. And um, infectious surveillance, like I said, is laboratory uh, based on laboratory confirmed pathogens, but syndromic surveillance based on um, symptom, symptoms. And the UK Health Security Agency, um, using the real-time syndromic uh, surveillance uh, team, they monitor these uh, syndromes. Um, and the uh, data for uh, the data comes from five different systems, five or six different systems. So initially, we used to have the GP in our service. So you, when you go to the GP and then the GP reports whatever uh, illness you have, or the GP out of our service, or the uh, NHS uh, 111. But during COVID, they introduced NHS 111 online. And uh, then they added the emergency departments and the ambulance departments. So we have six different systems that report to uh, Public Health England or the UK Health Security Agency uh, data. So uh, recently we decided to evaluate the algorithm that is used for infectious disease surveillance and the other one, RAMI, that's used for uh, uh, syndromic surveillance. And um, like I said, it's called uh, RAMI, the Rising Activity Multilevel Mixed Effects Indicator Emphasis. And we um, also decided to compare them to a third algorithm that is used at the US. It's called the uh, EARS uh, method, the Early Aberration Reporting uh, System. And it's, uh, the EARS method is based on uh, Schuhart control uh, charts. And uh, it also runs on a weekly uh, basis. So in the next slides, I'm going to tell you about this evaluation of those three algorithms and how that was done. Um, a bit more details about RAMI, which is used for syndromic surveillance. Uh, like I said, the Farrington method is a quasi Poisson regression based algorithm. RAMI is a multi-level mixed effects uh, <coughs> regression uh, model. Uh, because uh, why is it multi-level? Because it also takes into consideration uh, geographical uh, location, so the spatial aspect. Um, RAMI also, uh, within the regression model, it adjusts for bank holidays and the day of the week. Because it runs daily, it has to take into account uh, the days of the week. So Monday uh, reporting is different from Friday reporting. It's different from bank holiday reporting. Maybe during bank holidays, people might report less certain. Um, and it offsets, uh, uses as an uh, offset um, the daily fluctuations within the data. For threshold, uh, RAMI uses a uh, threshold based on three times the standard deviation. So if the current day exceeds three times the standard uh, baseline standard deviation, then an outbreak is, then an aberration is uh, signaled. So that's how RAMI works. How does EARS work? Um, so there are three different version of, uh, versions of EARS, C1, C2, and C3. They are labeled C, but they are not all uh, QSIMs. They're mostly based on uh, Schuhart range uh, of uh, control charts. And um, how does EARS decide whether uh, a signal should be, uh, should be alarmed or not, based on also multiples of standard deviation? So here are the three algorithms that we are going to evaluate. To evaluate them, we use a set of simulations. 
So the simulations, we had 16 scenarios, hopefully reflecting all scenarios that could happen, more scenarios that could happen in real life. And we did that by taking different scenarios for uh, the system where the data comes from. So whether it comes from GP out of hours, in hours, emergency department, NHS 101, we also took it into consideration, we based them on the real, uh, real symptoms. So we looked at the real data and we thought, okay, this is how different scenarios of real data look like. And we based um, simulations on those as well. Also, we took different uh, volumes uh, of data, which like small, less than 10, or large, better than 100, and um, different variations, uh, large peaks, uh, large seasonalities, small seasonalities, and whether it's based on a five day a week system or seven day a week system. So we know that GP in hours only runs from Monday to Friday, five day a week system. Whereas, um, uh, whereas NHS 111 basically runs throughout the whole week, seven day system. And then sometimes we fit a trend or not. So we considered many different uh, scenarios. And here's how the simulation uh, scenarios looked like. Like, as you can see, um, here you can see a trend, here you can see very steep uh, peaks, uh, other places just random. Um, to, from each one of these scenarios, we simulated hundreds. Uh, 100 data sets, and then we ran the three algorithms on the most recent data, took averages, and here are the results in the next, uh, in the next plot series. So in this plot, you can see results for sensitivity, probability of detection, and time limits. So um, time limits is how quickly the algorithm can detect an outbreak, and the smaller it is, the better. Uh, the difference between sensitivity and POD is POD is whether the algorithm detected an outbreak or not. Sensitivity takes into account how many times it detected it within the outbreak. But POD, uh, POD is just, did it detect it or not? It's just binary. Um, so if you look at the sensitivity, different colors for different uh, algorithms, you can see that uh, Ferent and Flexible has the highest sensitivity, whereas the EUC1 has the lowest one. Um, Rami over here has a high enough sensitivity and better timeliness than uh, parent and uh, flexible. The ears have good timeliness but not good sensitivity. Um, now, if you look up at the uh, probability of detection, we can see that uh, Rami, uh, Rami is, uh, performs best, um, and still, parent and method uh, has the uh, worst timeliness. For us, obviously, because it, it is designed to work weekly rather than daily. In this slide, uh, we see the results across the different uh, scenarios. So across the 16 different scenarios that I showed you early on. And uh, we see results for specificity, again, probability of detection, sensitivity, and uh, timeliness. So um, if, if we look at the specificity, the current inflexible, which is basically the, the um, um, black line, has the highest specificity. Um, so Rami is the dash line and ears is the dash dot line. Um, and for POD, confirming the results from before, we can see that um, we can see that uh, Rami behaves the, you know, performs the best. Parent and flexible doesn't perform as well as good for uh, signal five and 15. And these are the cases where we had like the very uh, steep, uh, steep peaks. Uh, timeliness also results like before. Rami is the best because it has the lowest timeliness. And um, sensitivity, uh, the same. Parent and flexible has the highest sensitivity. Um, Ears near it, but uh, Rami is the worst sensitivity. So, in conclusion, we can uh, we didn't think we couldn't observe that any of uh, one algorithm is better uh, across all measures. So each one is better for a certain measure. Um, due to their lower specificity, the ears uh, the ears versions. Uh, may not be as suited for multi-purpose daily surveillance. 
And the Faraday flexible has the highest sensitivity and specificity. So it could be uh, preferred in cases where we're looking for accuracy. Yeah, Rami has the um, slightly higher PLOG uh, than, uh, uh, than Farrington flexible. So it could be uh, preferred in cases where the aim is to see, uh, the aim is to see if the algorithm, if we wanted to see if there is an outbreak or not. And here is like a, is a compromise between all. So if you wanted like a good compromise between all of them, maybe you can use the ears negative binomial version. And finally, conclusion: Farrington flexible has the highest sensitivity and specificity, whereas Rami has the highest POD and is the most timely. So maybe a version of the Farrington algorithm that works on daily data could be a good idea. So in the end, we provided uh, the UK Health Security Agency with an algorithm that uh, evaluated um, Rami and the uh, and Farrington flexible also and ears. Uh, we recommended adjusting their syndromic uh, surveillance. Uh, uh, algorithm run for long-term trends. Um, we also developed simulations that uh, could be used, you know, for evaluations in uh, general and which have been used uh, recently by different uh, papers. And we showed that the ranking of algorithms is not affected by the characteristics of the uh, data signal that's being monitored. Okay, now I'm going to move to um, the next uh, evolution uh, of the algorithm, which is uh, recently, uh, in 2003, we have expanded the use of Farrington Flexible to multi-site uh, surveillance. And um, the whole project was triggered by colleagues in France. They had uh, sick leave data and uh, they wanted it, uh, but they had sick leave data across different companies. So um, an insurance company collected data about sick leave from all the companies that are registered within the insurance company. And they wanted to, to see if they could detect aberrations within sick leave. Sick leave is very related to uh, um, infectious disease or syndromic data because people tend to take more sick leave when they are uh, ill. Um, so we decided to develop a multi-site version of the Farrington algorithm and we use the sick leave data as an application, a good application for that. So the new multi-site algorithm, instead of using equality Poisson, now uses a negative binomial mixed effects regression with a random effect term for the site. Negative binomial can be proved to be easier and more natural to use, computationally less complex. Uh, it was adjusted for different covariates that are site-specific. So, in our case, that were company-specific. Uh, the seasonality still is based on the 10-level factor, like before. The trend is always fitted. The dispersion parameter is now computed from the negative binomial mixed effects model. And we use a negative binomial uh, quantiles. And for the uh, underweighting past outbreaks, we use now Pearson residuals instead of downstream. So little technical things, which pose many computational challenges, but also improve, we think, the algorithm a bit, quite a bit. Now, um, I will show you in the next slides, I uh, will illustrate through plots uh, the results, but now I'll give you a small summary before going to the plots. So when we compared this new multi-site algorithm to the existing Farrington flexible that is not multi-site, it's just one dimensional, it doesn't take into account uh, the spatial uh, concept. We find, found out that uh, the addition of a random effects um, allows simultaneous monitoring of aberrations over time and across sites. Um, also, the addition of site-specific covariates provided better modeling uh, because it provided a true representation of the data. So, for example, in our sick leave data, every company has its own specifications. Some companies had many employees, some companies had less employees, some companies had stricter rules for sick leave, some companies had less strict rules, so that was important. 
And uh, comparison between both the existing algorithm and the multi-site one showed that for medium outbreaks, the new mix effects algorithm provides better false positive rate and probability of detection. And for medium outbreaks, uh, uh, the false positive rate ranges between 0 0.015 and 0 0.025. So um, the false positive rate is based on the type, type 1 error. So in our case, that would be 0 0.025 because usually type 1 error at 0 0.05 and um, we're looking at just one-sided uh, model so um, this is the nominal value so the false positive rate, positive rate is pretty close and the probability of this detection is not bad for medium outbreak it's kind of average and how higher outbreaks mean higher false positive rate and uh, lower uh, the higher outbreaks mean higher probability of detection and lower false positive rates, and uh, probability of detection could even reach 100% for very high out outbreaks. Now, uh, when we applied the algorithm to our data, so the above results come from simulations, the current now come from the applications to real data. Um, we find that because we were applying it over like 1,376 companies, it was taking sometimes like an hour uh, to go across companies, across years, across the time. Uh, so to improve the computational complexity, we could stratify companies by groups, let's say. Um, but the algorithm is needed in particular multi-site settings where each site has its own specifications. And we also found some interesting results uh, with the multi-site algorithm regarding COVID-19, and I will talk about these in the next slides. So if you look at the graphs, uh, you, can now, uh, you can now see the previous summary that uh, if we can now illustrate the previous summary that I uh, just talked about. Um, the top graph uh, are the false positive rate for the Farrington flexible algorithm, the existing algorithm, versus the new mixed algorithm. So in black, we have the new mixed algorithm. In gray, we have the uh, existing one. So uh, the uh, horizontal line is the nominal false positive rate. So it's the true one. As we can see, the new algorithm's false positive rate is much closer than the uh, than uh, to the nominal value than the existing one. So as accurate as the existing one was, this one showed show better results. Um, regarding a probability of detection, they were very similar, both of them. Uh, in these graphs, uh, at the top, we can see uh, the false positive rate here and the probability of detection uh, how they change with outbreak size. So K is the outbreak size in this case. Uh, we can see that the K equal one is a small outbreak, three is medium outbreak, eight is large outbreak. We can see that the false positive rate um, goes down the higher the outbreak, and over here the probability of detection is higher the, uh, the larger the outbreak. Now the uh, figures here, uh, we compare both algorithms, uh, false positive rate and um, probability of detection, also based on outbreak size. So the higher the outbreak, um, the lower the false positive rate or both, but of course the new one has a more accurate false positive rate. And here we can see that also the higher the outbreak, the higher the probability of detection, and the new algorithm here is better than the existing one for very large uh, outbreaks. So for outbreaks, when you start reaching around outbreaks of 10 standard deviation, uh, that's when it becomes almost 100% accurate. Okay, so I'll move now to the application to sick leave data. So how does our data look like? Here we have got rates of sick leave across the 1,000, almost 300 companies that we have. Uh, from March 2018 to uh, 2020. So the vertical line here is the start of 2020, basically almost the start of COVID-19. You can see that sick leave uh, since lockdown, you know, has increased uh, majorly. And uh, 
Yeah, so this is how our liver looks like. You might have a completely different pattern after COVID. We have applied both the existing algorithm and the multi-site one uh, to uh, our uh, data. And uh, here I'm going to show examples of four companies, okay, by co per company. So this is a company with 75 workers, 92 workers, 126, and 2886. Um, and here we can see the sick leave rates before and after COVID. And um, the dotted line uh, over here is the um, is the uh, threshold for uh, detecting outbreaks for the new one. So obviously, uh, this this company um, they exceeded the threshold here, and this company as well. Uh, then, because they are not much different than before, uh, the sort of threshold wasn't uh, wasn't exceeded, and here 50-50. So different. Uh, different scenarios but what is for sure is that when there was a steep uh, a steep increase the algorithm was able to detect the covid jump so here is a uh, here is um, kind of hopefully a rounded um, a rounded explanation of how the current inflexible algorithm evolved uh, comparisons and uh, expansion to multi-site. Now, in the future, we're hoping to expand the Farrington method to daily detection and maybe add machine learning features that can adjust changes due to major shocks like the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>project um you can send him my idea i can't i don't think there are uh, massive sources because otherwise public health england wouldn't have you know wouldn't have communicated that to us uh basically more accurate could you repeat just a question yeah so paul is asking any good resources on how to model day of the week monthly slash public holiday please Um, one, yeah, so I can send him some of our ideas, but one of the papers that actually does uh, model public holidays, they use a moving uh, average approach, is by, um, I'll give you the uh, Buckingham Jeffrey, her name, Elizabeth Buckingham Jeffrey. I'll give you later on the, uh, the uh, reference. Yeah. Oh, yeah, maybe we can type it on the chat. Uh, okay. Do we have any questions in the room? I think, well, sorry, can I ask a question? Okay, first is, uh, you know, in terms of the, before the multi-site one, it's ordinary yeah. uh, Farrington uh, algorithm compared to the other algorithm in terms of computational time. Yeah. How do they compare to each other? Um, they're, they're almost instant, really. That is, you know, it's not. Uh, it's not a big thing. It's not major, unless you are applying it to hundreds of data sets, and you know, if you're applying one case, one scenario, it's almost instant. When you start applying it to many simulations, uh, you know, it takes obviously uh, longer. But I didn't. I didn't think there was massive uh, computational differences. So. Uh, so I assume, you know, I don't know if you've looked at the decision, you know, sort of tree where you, you know, is there something that you need to do, think about in order to choose one of the algorithms or how do you go on about choosing one of the algorithms depending on what you're trying to achieve? Have, have you looked at that? And no, but this is a good idea. I mean, 
we're, we're thinking of using machine uh, you know learning maybe decision kind of free stuff but not in the context that you mentioned but thank you know that's a uh, that way why not yeah uh, well just on that uh, have you thought about like doing an ensemble approach and just flatten them all into like a model averaging sticking them all in uh, no, the reason uh, being is that um, I'm not an expert on the other ones, so maybe if we have a PhD student that can mm -hmm. uh, do that, yeah, uh, why not? I, I've heard recently that someone has been uh, doing it, I think, um, can't say much mm -hmm. about it, probably on the review, but, um, but yeah, if not, then surely that could be something that, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, one more question, I don't think it's Sensible. Um, uh, you've got like the bus on camps. Uh, what, 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 well, I suppose this is like a, a data quality issue, really, like missing data. And what's the denominator for your for your camps? You know, like what's your offset? And what about like missing, um, like underreporting? And what about the issues with the, with the like mm -hmm. underlying data set? Uh, we don't use an offset as such, but like the, the model does have like a, it's a regression model, so it comes kind of in the in in the shape of like beta plus theta x, you know. Mm -hmm. So where where beta represents the volume of the data, so that's taken into consideration in the model. But we don't use an offset thing. But uh, regarding the sparseness, sparseness and missing uh, mm -hmm. uh, data, uh, we we don't usually have mi missing data as such because everything is you know reporting but we do have sparse data so we do have uh, organisms that don't get reported or symptoms that don't get reported for example you barely see any much hiv or um and for example polio say one case of polio could will, will be an outbreak yeah we don't need an algorithm to tell that um but the farrington method does use uh, does have uh, conditions for uh, sparseness severity so yeah so if the uh, uh, I forgot that now, but I think that uh, if the data is is low enough, it doesn't fit. You know, it, it makes decisions directly. It doesn't necessarily fit the linear model. So if you've got less than two points in a year, mm -hmm. how can you fit a linear model? You know, to connect these two points. So then it decides whether it's an algorithm or not based on um, certain conditions. Can okay. They are in the paper. They are in the main paper now. Um, OK, good. Thanks. Oh, we have another question. And I have another question. <laughs> and uh, Oliver Gray is saying, is there a good way of modeling slower drifts rather than outbreaks? So these are like seasonal peaks yeah also we have been talking about those how to differentiate those slow seasonal peaks let's say or if not seasonal peaks slow then outbreaks though and these are not spikes these or, or, or I, I think he's talking about let's say the, something like the pandemic yeah it, it was a was a quick enough increase but it wasn't a spike like one day spike or one week spike we have observed an increase over months yeah, or decrease, depending on the... Uh, again, this is a work in evolution, so I've got, you know, this is, well, I should have mentioned it as part of uh, further work. Um, yeah, I don't have a direct answer to that, but that's, yeah, that's... Work in evolution, you can contact me if uh, you would like, and we, we can share ideas. Oh. I'm very hurt what Angela said. Okay, uh, my question, uh, you know, the first data sets that you've used uh, that come from six different sources of uh, syndromic data, basically from you know, GPs and yeah. NHS. Have you used the uh, multi-site approach for fitting that? Uh, Rami does have a feature that does that, but I don't think they use it often. But if he wants, more information of that, he can contact Roger Morby. He's the one who uh, uh, he's the one who developed this algorithm and who at the moment monitors and you know um, maintains it. So Roger will be able to give him more information on whether they use it at all 
the geographical aspect of it, but it's there, but it doesn't, it's not used regularly. So, uh, sorry, I think that I'm asking is, uh, did you use the multi-site Farrington, you know, compared, to, because at the initial you used Farrington simply in, by combining all the data yeah. and looking at it. But with that data set, did you actually look as uh, from a multi-site yeah. perspective? No, well? we only recently published in 2023. So we haven't had the, the time to compare it, but yeah, probably we will do. It, it seems more... Similar to that, is it ramming? Mm -hmm. Ramy, Ramy. Well, now, that, yeah, now when I was actually presenting it, I thought it's similar, but Rami doesn't use the level factors or comparable weights. It, it uses different, uh, you know, ways of, of thresholds, uh, doesn't have the weighting procedure. So all those little tricks for Farrington are not there. But when I was presenting it, mm -hmm. I thought negative binomial, negative binomial, you know. Uh, but yes, uh, I think... The thing about the Farrington model is that, um, you know, all these little things make it make it better. The underweighting, the um, the uh, comparable weeks, the new level factor, the trend or uh, not. Um, yeah. you know what. You said the performance of the models was better for you know, bigger outbreaks than medium outbreaks. Mm. Now, when you're in the moment, you don't know actually how big it is and mm. how would you know how good is your prediction basically is going to be. And then what happens, in fact, something similar to Oliver is basically saying, OK, you know, it's medium now, but it's building up. And would the model be able to detect that building up and tell, you know, you have to intervene now, whatever it is. So it's just you know trying to gauge when will you pick up a big outbreak if it's a starting with you know small yeah. increments but mm -hmm. building up over a yeah. certain period of time. I think the higher the exceeding score, the higher the you know the outbreak. So the more every week, the more it increases. You can tell you know, or if it, the exceeding score shot up by quite a lot. And you can tell that the outbreak has now taken a big uh, step. But it's it's very difficult to tell at the time that outbreak is very, you know, medium, large or high. But what, what you can do is um, similar to how we build the simulations, see how much the current week now, how larger it is from baseline, from the baseline, how many standard deviations it is higher than the baseline. Then you get an idea probably on how high the outbreak is. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you very much, Angela, for all the efforts. Oh. <laughs> for you to right there. Uh, thank you very much, um, Ken, for coming from the US. Uh, I think it was a really, really interesting um, session. And uh, if you have any further questions online, so we do have quite a few people online. Uh, please just write it in the chat. I'm sure our speakers wouldn't mind uh, replying to them. And once again, uh, thank you very much.